Hi there guys, it's Mike from MCQ Bushcraft here and welcome to another episode of Bushcraft Basics. In the last episode of Bushcraft Basics we looked at fire feathers and that followed on from earlier episodes where we looked at ferrocerium rods. But the further we start moving into fire lighting skills and other bushcraft skills we're going to need to process larger materials and we're going to need to turn to heavier cutting tools to aid us in doing this. One tool that you really may want to consider is a saw and I have in front of me here a range of saws, uh, some very common, some probably not so common in the bushcraft world. But before we start looking at these saws and having a look at the differences between them, their pros and cons, and ultimately what they're designed to do, we're going to look at some terminology first. And it's not just to sound clever, it's terminology that will arm you with the knowledge and the tools to be able to look at a saw subjectively and understand what it's good for and why it's different from the one lying next to it. There's a lot of different saws out there and they're all good at different jobs and designed for different things and it's important to understand the differences between them before you select one. Before we get started I've just made a cut in this piece of hazel here and if I move the saw out like that you can see that I've actually created a gap in the piece of wood where I've been sawing. This is referred to as the kerf, this actual gap we've created, the cut that we make with the saw. And if you hear me use that term at any point throughout the video, this is what I'm referring to. I've drawn a handsaw at the top of this chalkboard here, mainly just as a point of reference. Later on we're going to start talking about the rake on teeth, which is the lean, whether it leans towards the toe or the heel of the saw, which determines whether it's a push or a pull saw predominantly. So I've put this diagram here really just to show you that when I'm doing illustrations later, that's the way the tooth is actually leaning. If I reference it pointing towards the toe or pointing towards the heel, you can understand that the toe is where the cutting edge ends, where the teeth end at the very edge of the saw blade. If we go back to the very beginning of the blade here where it comes into the handle, we have the heel just there. So at least you have that point of reference. But the first term we're going to have a look at on a saw is actually called the set. And a lot of you may have heard of this. If we pick up this crosscut saw here and we look down the saw just like this what you'll see is that the teeth aren't in a straight line. Let's say we've got a piece of wood here like this, you know, a nice log running along there and if we draw our saw blade going into the piece of wood like this that's the body of the saw whether it be any kind of saw at this point it doesn't really matter and at the very end the teeth <laughs> are actually offset like that. We made that cut in that piece of hazel earlier. If we didn't have that offset, then this body of the saw would get trapped in the piece of wood. It would get stuck. And you may have all experienced this when you pick up an old bow saw with a very old blade on it. This one's not too old. But if we picked up an old bow saw and we started sawing into a piece of wood, sometimes you can find that you're really having to push and you can actually feel the body of the blade rubbing against the kerf. And that's simply because the offset on the teeth has worn away or the teeth have somehow been pushed back in like this very slightly so the kerf isn't wide enough to clear the body of the saw. So now I've drawn the actual kerf there in line with the offset teeth there on the cutting edge of the saw. You can see you can clear the actual body of the saw and you generally find that um, on greenwood blades, much like this bow saw here, it has a greenwood blade on it and I'll tell you why in a moment, um, you have quite a lot of offset on the actual teeth, much more than something like this cross-cut saw here, this carpentry blade. This will be much more offset, and it's simply to contend with the fact that you're dealing with a lot of sap and sawdust mixing together and creating a paste that clogs up that kerf very quickly. So you have to have large teeth and you have to have deep gullets in between the teeth which are these gaps in between the teeth there, to allow all of the actual swarf that you're creating in the kerf to go somewhere. So as you push the saw, it moves it along the kerf and chucks it out the other end. And as you pull back, it does the same. So you generally find on greenwood blades, you have a wider set than you would on a drywood blade designed to carpentry. But at the same time, there are pros and cons with that. For example, on a greenwood blade, um, you're not really too worried about producing a very, very clean sort of precision cut like you would in carpentry. So what happens is, is with that wider set, you get that wider kerf, the saw won't track as easy. 
and it skates around in the kerf a little bit more, leading to a rougher cut. But even though that might sound like a disadvantage, it's actually exactly what you need for green wood and it's fit for purpose. And what you can see as well on this blade here, if I draw it at the bottom, is you have the pegs in sets of four, like that. And then you have a deep gullet and you have something called a raker blade like that. And the raker blade isn't offset, it's in the middle in line with the body of the saw. And it's just there to aid in clearing all of that sawdust and sap mixed together out of that kerf and allow you to keep sawing. And if at any point all this got clogged up here, the actual saw would stop functioning properly and it'd be very difficult to operate. If we have a look at this Taylor Brothers saw from Adelaide, this is a cross-cut saw, uh, you can see the teeth are very, very small on this saw and the gullets in between the teeth are very small as well. Um, it's not designed to deal with green wood, it's designed for accuracy and precision. And you can see a very tall body on the saw, which also aids in it going in a straight line um, through the piece of wood. We'll talk about what a cross-cut cross saw and a rip saw is a bit later on, but this is a cross-cut saw and um, it's designed for going across the grain, nice and straight. And you certainly wouldn't use something like this to achieve the same result, but at the same time you wouldn't use this to go through a piece of green wood and expect it to be easy. So putting the set aside, another term we're going to have a look at is the rake. A saw, what is the rake? And I know we just talked about a raker blade on that greenwood blade, that's something a little bit different. Rake actually means something slightly different on the saw. And what it means is the way in which a saw tooth is leaning from a zero position. And it's a really important thing to understand that it can be a little confusing because it doesn't mean which way the actual tooth is pointing, whether it's pointing to the toe or heel. It means which way that tooth is leaning from a zero position, regardless of which way it's facing. Now that may not make sense at this moment, but hopefully it will at the end of this. So if we have a look at this tooth here, for example, let's say that's a saw tooth there. They're usually on these carpentry tools about 60 degrees like this, but you can see that that is the zero position there. That, that line there, if you imagine that as being 90 degrees, that's the zero position. Now, that's called a zero rake, but you can have a slightly different rake as well. You could have a negative rake, and what that would mean is that the tooth is still about 60 degrees, but it leans back just very slightly like that, and you'll see that on most cross-cut cross saws. In fact, a lot of saws will be like this. So that zero line's just there, and let's say you've got um, 45 degrees here, and then you've got 15 degrees here, like that. And um, that's a slightly more common setup that you see. You normally see this in a rip saw, and uh, we'll go into what a rip saw is later on. I know there's quite a lot to take in if you're not familiar with saws, but you know, hopefully this will all make sense. And that's what you normally see on cross-cut saws or any kind of saw that I've got here. Um, on a bow saw, in actual fact, you normally see a very even rake like this, and that will mean something different. So we have a zero line, 30 there, 30 there, like that. So we still maintain that tooth geometry, but we've divided it in half. And on a Japanese pull saw, you generally see what you call a positive rake, and that means the tooth actually leans forward like that, very slightly. So there's your zero line, there's your 60 degrees just here like that, and um, the tooth is actually leaning. But what does this actually mean for the performance of the saw? Well, let's put aside whether it's a push or a pull saw for the minute. So this here, you most likely see this zero rake set up in a rip saw, and we'll go into what a rip saw is a little bit later, but basically a rip saw is designed to go down the grain line and rip out a portion of the grain like a chisel and that's why you see this set up, and it is very effective. It will cross-cut, but it's obviously better suited for the job it was designed for. This setup here is very common in most saws, uh, cross-cut saws, a lot of these green uh, woodworking pruning saws, you'll see it in those, and um, you have something that's predominantly gonna cut when it's going this way, 
but when it goes this way it will skate over the cut a little bit more which has its pros and cons but mostly pros in what it's designed for and we'll have a look at some saws and relate that to it in a moment. This here is what you generally see in your bow saw setup, a frame saw, a blade supported at both ends, a very thin blade, it doesn't matter if it's thin because it's held at both ends and it cuts as equally as it does on the push or the pull regardless of which way it's going. Um, this setup here is what you tend to see on your Japanese saws a little bit more, your, the ones that are designed for, for pull saws. Um, not so much the silkies, they're more like this. But when you start getting into carpentry and you see the, the true Japanese pull saws, they're set up like this and they're very thin saws. And there's a good reason for that. And that's because you don't want it doing any cutting when it goes this way. Because it's such a thin saw that if it catches on the push, the saw will buckle. You want it to skate over the cut, going this way, and then when you draw back this way, it does all of its cutting like that. So you're clearing the kerf, cutting, clearing the kerf, and cutting. And that's what happens there. Now the silky Zubat that I have just here has a blade more like this, which is kind of a happy medium. This is a, a pruning saw basically for arborists and woodland managers and green woodworkers going out, cutting limbs. Its design is completely suited towards that and we'll cover that when we have a look at the saw specifically. But we have this secondary line on the edge there and what that does is it allows it to go this way and not catch, but come back that way and do quite a bit of cutting. And it means that when you're sawing quickly outside in sort of awkward positions, the saw doesn't catch and buckle like that. You see a lot of people using these saws too quickly, especially the folders, and they snap the tips off because they're catching it too much. You need to just have a nice steady motion and rely on the saw to predominantly cut on the pull stroke, which is um, what this saw's really for. One thing that is worth mentioning is that when you start getting into these carpentry blades like this and they become very thin and they're push saws, what will happen is, is you'll see a rib form along the top and that rib is just to make the saw very very rigid but still have a very thin fine saw with a fine set and fine teeth to be able to do a very nice cut into a piece of timber and give you some accuracy. But let's go into our next term which is called the fleam. So what is the fleam on a saw? Well some saws have fleams, some do not. Primarily a rip saw will not have a fleam. So when we look at a saw, let's say, let's take a rip saw where the teeth are gonna be like this. And we've discussed that, why the teeth would be like that. It's because the teeth are actually chisels. Now, this saw here, this Henry and Diston saw is a rip saw. You can see that by the teeth, but how do you know that for certain? It could be a crosscut saw just with a very, very steep zero rake on it, but it isn't, it's actually a rip saw. And you can see that by looking straight down onto the actual teeth, just like this. And instead of seeing blades, we see chisels, and that tells us it's a rip saw. So when we look at this front on, what we see, in fact, if I draw the actual blade like that, let's say we've got that set there, we see that like that. So the blade, the actual tooth is flat. So if this was face on like that, we're looking down the saw like this, then the teeth are flat. They have no bevel on, they have no knife edge bevel. So what they're designed to do is if we have a piece of timber, let's say we've got a, a plank just here like that. And um, you know, it's like a piece of two by four or something and all the grain goes this way, like this. What that saw is designed to do is go down the grain like that. And it actually removes that column of grain that we see and uh, produces a very straight cut for us and it's very, very efficient. But what is a cross cut saw? We've got our rip saw just there. So a cross cut saw is a little bit different. If we draw the actual set on the cross cut saw, it's like that. So instead of flat chisels here and here, we have blades, cutting blades, like a knife. And it looks a little bit like, like this. Remember that set we talked about earlier, where you have a slightly negative rake on the actual teeth. They lean back slightly. 
Um, or like the bow saw, which has a very even rake on it. You know, the teeth are absolutely even each side, so it cuts on the push and pull. Um, what you would have is blades like that on the actual teeth. Now they'd be offset from each other, so there's, there are blades on this one too, but they're round the other side. They're one-sided, effectively. You have one bevel, and they can be anything from zero, which is what we have here, a zero bevel, or we could have 10 degrees, or we could go up to a sort of 20 degrees, even more sometimes on these hybrid saws that are coming out now. They have really, really aggressive fleams on, which is why they cut so aggressively. So the fleam will allow us to identify whether it's a rip saw or a crosscut saw. And you have depth as well in these actual these bevels too. So if this bevel came down like that, this depth that the actual bevel protrudes into the body of the saw blade is called the slope. You don't really need to know that and it's, it's to be honest with you, we probably should keep this simple, but it's worth knowing it's, it's the slope basically. So, uh, you know, you can have a really aggressive slope on it and a, a quite an aggressive blade. Again, like some of the silky saws that you see out there that are designed predominantly for for people who work in um, woodland management, they're, they're pruning tools, so they, they're going to be like that. As we said earlier, you have to deal with wet wood and sawdust mixed together, so really you need as much help as possible, allowing all that swarf to move around as we're cutting and not clog up the actual kerf that we're making in the wood. So now that we've had a look at all of that terminology there, we can start looking at saws specifically and, and sort of relating back to that, and you'll understand what I mean when I say the tooth predominantly leans towards the heel or the toe, or we have a very, very sharp fleam on the or very sharp bevel or steep fleam on the actual tooth there. Um, deep gullets has a very deep slope on the fleam, all these different things. So, and you'll, you'll be able to know why it's a push or a pull saw, and it, it just helps you understand why the saw does what it does best. And we're going to start with some of these most common saws here that you see used in in the outdoors, in bushcraft, in, in woodland skills, and um, make our way along and uh, have a look at how they differ from one another. We'll start with the back of Laplander. Very common saw this, very popular saw. Use, people use it outdoors, in bushcraft. It's basically a multifunctional pruning saw. Um, the advantages of a folding saw straight off the bat are that its sheath is part and parcel of its entire design much like a folding knife that can be put in the pocket. The advantage of a folding saw is that the saw is inside its own handle. It can go in a compartment, it can go in a bag, it can go in a cargo pocket. I put mine sometimes in this Fjallraven pouch here and just carry it around with me if I go for a walk or something. Um, and that, that's the, the advantage of it. So it's not something you need a sheath for, basically. One massive advantage of the Baco Laplander over a lot of other folding saws, especially the Silkies, is that it locks when it's actually closed, and there's a lot to be said for that. If we push this button and open up the saw, because that's what we have to do to unlock it, it locks in place and it won't move. It's only got one locking position. Ergonomical handle, rubberized, designed to be used outdoors, slight grip. You can see it's a pull saw straight away, um, although it will do some cutting on the push. It's predominantly a pull saw. Um, you've got a little bit of negative rake on the actual tooth there. So the tooth is, is leaning back slightly from a zero position, but it's still facing the heel of the blade. So that's where it's going to do most of its cutting. You have seven points per inch, and that's how you measure how many teeth there are per inch. That's how a saw's kind of measured really in a way. You've got seven points per inch, which is pretty standard for a greenwood blade. Um, this is a multifunctional blade on the Baco. This is the XT range, the 396 XT range, which is what comes with that. Exactly the same blade that you get with this orange one here, the newer orange one, the 396 XT. If we open that up, exactly the same, but orange. I prefer this one because I don't lose it then when I drop it, if I do, or I put it down. But this one has a non-friction coating, this one doesn't. But we have another backer here, if you bought one years and years ago, I think this one's back in the 1990s, um, you would have got a different blade with your backer. In fact, you would have this blade here, which is the JT blade that they do, 396 JT blade. And you'll see straight away 
that there's a distinct difference. So we have a blade there that is basically the same tooth pattern as the Silky. Backer do a range of blades for their saws. Um, as I say, you can get the JT blade and they describe what they're good for. This is gonna be a, a very fast green wood cutter. This blade cuts just as fast as the Silky saws. I see a lot of videos of people saying that the Silkies are a superior saw to the Bako. Um, I prefer the Bako personally, and, I, and most of the people I work with in woodland management who are, are full-time professionals will, will take the Bako over the Silky. And uh, I carry it in my pocket, but it's not the only saw I carry. Unless I'm just going out for a walk or something like that, it's not the only saw I carry. And you've got to understand its limitations. It's a folding saw. It's a folding saw, so you know that's the weakness really in a folder. It's that join there. Um, whether it's a fixed blade saw is going to be a bit stronger for you. So, you know, you carry a folding saw because you want it to fold into itself and go in a pocket. You know, for me, I, I wouldn't buy one of these and have it on my belt, really, in a sheath because that's not really why, why I kind of benefit from it. If you're going to do that, you might as well just get a fixed blade saw if you're going to wear it on a sheath. But let's have a look at the Silky, very popular saw. This is one of Silky's smaller folders. Um, they do a huge range of folders from very, very large ones to ones that like swords. If we open this, you can see straight away why this is going to cut a lot quicker than the standard XT blade on the back of Laplander. You've got an incredibly aggressive saw there with a very, very hard steel, a bit harder than this, I think. And um, you can see there that that's predominantly going to cut on the pull we've got. A, uh, a tremendously steep fleam, so the bevel on the saw. We have that secondary lean on the tip of the tooth, so it's going to skate across my hand, but when I draw back you can see it's biting and it's going to cut predominantly on that pull stroke. The Silky um, just opens, it's not a, not a locked when closed blade. has a nice ergonomic handle, you can see already it's in, in the pull saw shape. Um, as you're pulling back towards you, you have that pommel just there or that lump to, um, to, be, to be pulled back and uh, we've got this mechanism here, it can adjust, you can do that if you're at a weird angle, say you're pruning in a tree, which again what this saw is for, it's a pruning saw and we can drop it back like this. And they do a huge range of saws, I think one up from this is, is a good size as well but any bigger it starts to get a bit, bit kind of ridiculous and you have to remember that it is a folding saw at the end of the day. So. Better to have a folding saw in pocket form and a primary saw in your pack than um, just relying on a big folder like this. But uh, that's the Silky for you, a fast cutter, uh, green wood, does dry wood fast too. You know, good for the outdoors really in that respect. We have a couple of Silky's fixed blade saws here. I can never pronounce this one. What's it called? The Gomtaro 240. So we have the Gomtaro 240 and the Zubat, and these are fixed saws. Um, so if you're looking for something that doesn't fold and you don't mind carrying a sheath on you, and you want it to be a little bit stronger, then you know you can have these saws as well with a sheath. You know, if you're walking around all day and you need something that's quick to access on a belt, and that's really where, where these excel. You'll be walking around, you'll be doing some coppicing. You need to just pull the saw out and use it. That's where this comes in. On your belt, come straight out, do the cut, go straight back in. And that's really where these excel, and you see people who are walking around managing woodlands, they've got them on their belts hanging there, they need to chop something, they come straight out. And obviously this goes in a pocket, it doesn't need a sheath, that's the advantage of that. So we have a, a curved blade on this one, this is the Zubat. And we have the same tooth geometry as, as this here, we don't need to talk about it. It's an aggressive cutter, uh, hard steel, um, it's going to skate over the top like this, you know, I don't have to worry too much about that at all. But as soon as we pull back, it's going to tear my hand apart because that's where it's predominantly going to do all of its cutting. It's going to do all the cutting on the pull stroke. This is a good blade though, I mean you can tell it's a pull saw, look at that design. That's not going to be a push saw, if that was a push saw, it'd be flipping horrible to use. I don't think anyone would buy it. but. Um, you know, as a pull saw, it's excellent and it's ergonomical, it's comfortable. And this curve means you don't skate in the kerf too much. So when you're in that kerf cutting, um, you're always making contact. You're always, the, the, the tips of these teeth are always applying 
a great deal of pressure into the kerf as they're doing their cut and um, that's what makes it such an excellent tool actually. But you're going to want to use these tools on a bench, you're not really, because if you're cutting a piece of wood on the end of a bench, you're pulling up and this arm is then having to support that piece of wood as you pull against it. That's why push saws excel at what they do really. You know, if we take this cross cut saw here, if we're sawing on a saw horse, as we go down we're forcing the piece of wood into the bench, into the saw horse and we can keep that cut very close to the end of the bench, meaning we don't get any delamination or fraying of the actual grain, and it keeps it nice and clean for us as well. It's a very bright day in the woodland today, so I apologise if everything seems a little bit illuminated. It's like someone's shining a halogen light on me in the dark, but it's either that or the rain at this time of year, so uh, I prefer this. But anyway, bow saws are very, very efficient. They cut on the push and the pull, you can use them on a sawhorse effectively because of that push stroke. Um, you can use them to coppice high up if need be. And there's different variations. The only real downside to them is their size. Um, but you do get takedown frame saws like this one Chris Morris made for me. This is his prototype model made of softwood. He's doing some oak and other woods out of them. But uh, you can see that lovely saw and it's a takedown quite easily. You've got the tensioner here that you twist and that pulls this in here and here and it makes the blade nice and rigid for you. I would probably put a drywood blade on this um, because I find drywood blades to be more useful for me because I process a lot of firewood. That's predominantly what I'd use this saw for doing is processing firewood and the lovely thing about these frame saws when they're made right like this one, balanced, very balanced bit of kit. It's lovely to operate. The only downside is, is you've got to assemble it, but if you're on your way to camp and you're carrying a smaller saw in your pocket, which is what I would be doing, if you do see anything you need and it's not too big, you can use it at a whim and um, it's not too bad. But uh, yeah, these saws are really useful and I probably will put a, a dry wood blade on this and give it a, a good test. I've done quite a bit of wood with it already and uh, yeah, I really like it actually. So the advantage of this is it's lighter than a bow saw and it can be taken down. And obviously the thing about bow saws is, is the blades are cheap. But the way this saw works is we move that paddle out the way and we spin the paddle like that. We let the tension off of the actual blade. We take that out, pop that socket out there. You can let the saw hang then, pop that out. That comes out and then this folds round. So because of this huge set on this these are greenwood blades, it can be a bit bitey on the way in, but that's easily remedied. This goes together like that, and then this wraps around there, and then, you know, you buy some kind of tube to put it in on the side of your pack to keep it water resistant, or you just make a leather or canvas pouch for it and you have it on the side of your backpack. I'm gonna make something to strap it to the frame of my frame pack, um, so this can be my my camp tool and when I'm there in the evening I can I can basically get logging with loads of nice big logs and it means that fire burns all night and I'm not having to walk around all the time grabbing pieces of wood and feeding it which is never fun you just want to chill in the evenings when you're around the campfire but there are lots of other types of bow saws as well we have small bow saws like this this is a brilliant little saw I used this one for years a little 11 inch backhoe with a dry wood blade on it um, good for green wood too you've got such deep gullets in the actual teeth and sets of three and enough space there in that kerf to let the green wood on all the mulch you create escape but you've just got to bear in mind that if you're doing big bits of green wood that's when you're going to run into trouble the little stuff and saws like this with the wrong um, uh, sort of blade on it the wrong teeth don't really feel it too much it's when you get into the bigger stuff but I like the design of these because they open like that and then you just put in a new blade and you tension it up just like this and it usually has enough tension. Sometimes they can need adjusting but it's very rare unless they get really old. You might see a bow saw like this though and think why on earth is it that shape? And you'll see coppices and uh, people in uh, sort of the woodland management sector use this quite a lot. And the reason being is it fits into gaps and you can use that portion of the saw to fit into a gap. This portion can be used for logging. You start off with the whole saw and as you get through the log, you start to go towards the back and go through, and you can fit your, the nose of the saw. Um, the actual toe gets into little gaps, and um, you know it's really useful for that. 
Uh, but this one has a sort of tensioner on the back that's like a bolt basically that you twist and, and it loosens it up and then you tension it. And to be honest with you, some people really don't like these because they almost seem like they're prone to fail, but I actually like them. And the reason being is it allows you to, to kind of feel the blade a bit and then just do a half turn, feel it a bit more, a little half turn, and then the blade is rock solid then. And um, with these ones, they're non-adjustable, you see, but with this one, you can extend the life of a blade that bit more. But if you tighten it up too much, it'll snap the blade, usually at these eyes at the end where you've got holes in the, in the blade. But that one's nice and rigid. They don't all have backhoes on me. This is a Hercules. And again, you've got that latch on the back. That can be a bit, it's a, this is a cheap one. This was eight pounds, nasty, cheap uh, greenwood blade on it. Uh, just uh, listen to the sound of it. Yeah, not great, but the backo do a good one. This is a 21 inch backo with their twist design on the back. Give that a half turn, very rigid drywood blade on it and this is the one that I carry in my uh, my 4x4. I have that and a pair of secateurs, like a big pair of loppers and um, you know they do me pretty well actually. So bow saws are good all rounders. Push and pull, good for cross cutting because when you're out here cutting wood and you're cutting through rounds you're always going across the grain most of the time. It's very rare that you go down the grain line um, you know, in, in situations like this, unless you're doing notches and such, but then these saws will do that job anyway. The one thing you will want to make sure you hang on to with these bow saws is the guard. You usually get a piece of plastic with them and uh, you can clip it on and then if it goes in a pack it's not going to catch on anything and uh, there are better things you can make for them. You can make like a slip that they, they sit in and have it on the side of a pack for example. But do keep, a, keep an eye on that guard, they get lost very easily. We do have this saw here. This saw was made in Adelaide, Taylor Brothers, Tangonia T8. So this is a, a cross cut saw, or it's been, been sharpened like one. Um, yeah, nice saw. These old saws are, are lovely for working with. If you have a workshop and you, um, you're looking for good tools, then I always try and go for the old stuff and um, you know, try you know, as long as it's got a decent blade on it and it's not been neglected. But um, that's a lovely cross cut saw, deep blade, gonna go nice and straight, narrow kerf, saw will track well. You know, sometimes when these things don't track too well, you need to look down them. And this one is um is as straight as an arrow, so that's pretty good. And then we looked at this one earlier when we were talking about um the actual rake of the blade and the uh, fleam, so this one has no fleam and it has a, a 90 degree rake on it. So this is a rip saw, a very aggressive rip saw. And um, you can see that quite easily. And this is the, the Henry Diston D8. And uh, yeah, lovely saw, made in Philadelphia. Really nice bit of kit, you can see the, um, the emblem just there. Again, you know, these are collector's items really now, but I mean, this, this was 25 pounds. So whoever sold it didn't really know what they were selling. But again, that's for going down the grain, as we talked about. So it's not going for across the grain. We've got this plank here. It'll be going down the grain and it's a really aggressive saw. So you really want to be working on a proper bench or something to, to use something like this. So we've covered a number of things about saws. There's actually much more to it as well, but uh, I think this is probably enough for bushcraft basics. And um, if you get into working with wood and carpentry and you start moving into saws even more, you'll learn more about it or even woodland management. A lot of the tools you see in, in the pruning side of things, which is all of this here, in um, kind of wood, woodland management basically, they're, they're all very, very similar in what they do. And predominantly you'll see a lot of pull saws simply because if you have a piece of wood sticking out the ground like that, a branch, it's much easier to have a, a little pull saw and keep your arm nice and straight and pull towards yourself than it is to push and try and keep that piece of wood from jittering around. Whether it's just the opposite in the workshop where you have a bench and you're pushing down, pushing that piece of timber in to the actual bench to keep it steady or on the sawhorse. And um, 
It's really up to you to go out and try these things and work out what you want for what you're doing. If you're going out and you're doing bushcraft and you're watching bushcraft basics because you practice bushcraft skills, then I would probably recommend something on the sidelines of a small backhoe or silky in your pocket. Personally, I prefer the backhoe. Um, and something like a frame saw or a, uh, a bow saw for when you're around the fire and you've got to process a lot of wood. Perhaps you don't want to do that, so um, maybe you just carry one saw like this uh, that you just get used to using on the pull stroke and um, you know you can use this saw, saw here. Just bear in mind that when it wears away um, you'll have to pay a lot of money for a new one. You know, something along the lines of £60 where there is a bow saw blade is two or three pounds. So there's lots, lots of trade-offs, lots of trade-offs. It's up to you to make those decisions. I've made mine. I do what I do when I'm outside um, and, uh, and that's the way it goes. So I hope this video helped you out. I hope you found it useful and I'll see you very soon in another episode of Bushcraft Basics. Take care.